is the second part of our conversation uh, in our commemoration of the fourth yard site of Rabbi Schulweis. Rabbi Schulweis always taught us that um, we leave something behind in the world, we leave specifically our influence, the moral teachings of the Torah that we advocate. And one of the issues that was important to him was his concern, his con consternation, that religion in general and Judaism in particular had become so turned inward. Religion certainly has to deal with the inner life, but for Rabbi Shulweis, the inner life an inner life that was not also turned outward, an inner life that did not see itself as responsible for the world outside was selfish, was solipsistic, it was irrelevant. And so he always taught us both to consider the world of conscience within, but also to take action outside. So we have decided, we've, de we've invited two wonderful, wonderful teachers of religion to join us in this conversation. Last night, we met with Imam Jihad Turk, the president of the uh, New Islamic College at the Claremont Theological School. Had a wonderful conversation with Imam. And it will be, um, it's not streamed, but it will be online uh, if you'd like to watch it, if you, haven't, if you weren't here last night. And today, I'd like to welcome a dear friend, the Reverend Mark Whitlock. Uh, Reverend Whitlock is the chief pastor of Christ Our Redeemer Church in Irvine. As well, he teaches at the University of, Cal uh, University of Southern California. I, I told him that uh, he's welcome to mention Jesus, but if he mentions USC, he could get in trouble. Because <laughs> this is a pretty partisan UCLA crowd. Um, but, uh, and, and Mark, in addition to that, um, as, uh, is in charge and has, has, has initiated, inspired numbers of, of initiatives in the community. Uh, for touching the community and bringing the community closer together. We've worked together on a number of programs and panels, and so I thought of the first person I thought of to represent both the Christian tradition and the African-American church tradition uh, in this conversation is Reverend Whitlock. So please welcome. I want to start right at the heart of this, because it's important that we, uh, we speak the truth together. And um, first of all, thank you for coming. I know it's busy season for you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> we would call this yuntif, you know. So you, a rab you invite a rabbi a week before Rosh Hashanah, he's going to give you a hard time. But Oh, you're here. Come in. Come in. This is Imam Jihad. Come in. Join us. What? No, no, get, get a chair up here. Come on, come on. You're, you're in, uh, Douglas. Help. Get a, get a chair. This is R Imam Jihad Turk. So come on up. Wow. Come on up. I just said nice things about you. I'm so glad you came. You know, Reverend Whitlock, Imam Jihad. Good to. Oh, this is a joy. Um, just, just recap your whole talk from last night. It was. <laughs> it probably took ten seconds. No, no, it took me an hour and a, no, it was beautiful. It was a beautiful talk. Um, so I want to begin at the same place I began with the Imam last night. Religion and its place in the world, and specifically religion and politics. Hmm. Is it possible to have faith that's not political? And on the other hand, if, is faith necessarily political? If you, if you invest in the inner life, how does that reflect upon the outer life? For me, it's about putting the pieces Put, put the together. mic right up to you. For me, it's putting the pieces together. Without politics, the pieces will never fit. A uh, wonderful scholar says, how, Karl Barth, how do you separate the soul of the saint from the soul of the community in which the saint lives? Dr. King would say they're inextricably bound. As much as you would have to love UCLA, without USC, you would have no real motivation. <laughs> <laughs> well, just, let, let me just catch him up, because he was a, I, I, I mentioned to the Reverend that he's welcome to talk about Jesus, but not to mention SC, because uh, <laughs> that would be so. Um. In our tradition, it is about what we believe. Uh, and sometimes what we believe gets in the way of our deeds because we do great belief, but we don't always manifest great deeds. Uh, so when one accepts Jesus Christ, it almost becomes a privatized salvation or a privatized moment where I believe that it is personal, but 
religion should never be private, yet we have made it rather, we've privatized it. We insulate ourselves in beautiful buildings while the community is going to hell in the handbasket. We have wonderful services uh, yet and celebrate on Sunday, but on Monday, many of our members have nothing to eat. Uh, if you look at the challenge of clergy, uh, some of you may have read the article where the pastor uh, gave his wife a $200,000 $200, Lamborghini. My wife, of course, looked at me and said, why am I driving a Yugo? Can't you do as well as him? Uh, <clears throat> Your wife is not driving a Yugo. <laughs> <laughs> My wife graduated from uh, University of Chicago Law, and uh, she now is our chief operating officer. I pay her $25,000 a year, and I think that's a very good salary. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. She loves you. She does. Yeah. She does love me, but she said, if you don't pay me more, you'll miss me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really do believe the challenge is if the pieces are not fitting, if we fail to speak truth to power, if we fail to let our voices be heard in the halls of, 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 of government, even when uh, we have a president is, that has decided on his own to, cut short, to shut government down, um, we must speak up and we must speak up loudly. Our failure to speak up means that we've left that which we believe, that which we hold sacred, the power of God uh, at home in our wonderful hallowed halls. And so for us as African Methodist Episcopal uh, Church, in our African Methodist Episcopal Church tradition, we were born out of a social gospel. We were born out of the thought that we must not only tell Pharaoh, but we also must tell the Pharaoh now in the White House, let my people go. And the failure to do that means that we are not only coming short of our belief, but we're also failing to meet the needs of people who are lost, people who are hungry, people who have no voice or certainly have a fear if their voice is shared. Uh, what I am disgusted about uh, are, are my colleagues. My colleagues uh, tend to be afraid to speak up because of the mix group that we minister to. Uh, we, know, we, know, we know that uh, many of you are watching or reading blogs or watching podcasts. And so when we preach on Sunday morning, you're often referencing what we say on the cell phone and comparing it to another preacher or comparing it to another denomination. And so you question. And we also know that many of our members are not uh, Democrat, but, but they're Republicans. And, and so when we do speak, we have to also take into consideration that we have to make sure the bills are paid, that salaries are covered, that um, the lights come on the next Sunday. So there is this fear often in the pulpit today that if I say the wrong thing, I could have somebody walk out like I'm having right now. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and that's happened, it, it's happened. I, I, I was on the pulpit when Barack Obama was, first decides to run, and I get over the pulpit uh, feeling very comfortable uh, about endorsing him, not worried about ACLU, not worried about any of that, and I endorse him over the pulpit, and then when I do that, everybody, and we have about 4,000 members, and everybody stands up and shouts. But then I looked over to my right, and I saw 50 people immediately get up and walk out of the church, never to come back. Uh, they, they weren't necessarily for the Republican Party, but they were for Hillary Clinton. And they said, why are you endorsing him over our candidate? Uh, Hillary Clinton. So walked, while they walked out and, and, and the seats weren't filled uh, because of their absence, um, but they also walked out with their pocketbooks. And so probably about uh, at least $100,000 uh, or more walked out of the door. And so pastors now have this great fear that if I say the wrong thing, if I say it in the wrong way, I may find myself on YouTube and and so I can lose not only members today, but I'll lose future members. And the real challenge is, is that we have allowed media, social media, and then our own fears to uh, mute us. 
And for me, that's a challenge. For me, that's a, a, a real problem because it, if our beliefs don't match our deeds, then what good is the religion that we're practicing? I want to push you just a little bit on this, something that we've talked about. Um, there is a very large body of the Christian community that uh, supports a sort of right wing. <coughs> you all right? Yeah. Take a breath. <coughs> Anytime okay. you talk about evangelicals, I almost puke. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> well, that sort of answers the question. <laughs> <laughs> There's a large body of the Christian community that supports a very right-wing political agenda. And I'm interested in, help, help us understand that. Help us understand that connection and, and, how, and how, that, how that came to be. So in the Roman government during Constantine, Constantine would uh, endorse Christianity because the, 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 the parade was marching in that direction anyway. He endorses it, he co-ops the movement, he politicizes it, and now he has an opportunity to control it. Uh, and we have this thing called the Apostles' Creed, and, and it was changed to fit the needs of um, Constantine. And so we have, I have real struggle with some of the litany, uh, litanies in the church, some of those creeds in the church that have been co-opted by politics. The same is true today, the Evangelical Party. First, evangelicals is a wonderful, it, it's a wonderful marketing term, right? Because in our tradition, the book of Matthew chapter 28 says, go out and make disciples out of all nations. Uh, so we are to evangelize. We are to go forth and share our faith. And so we're all evangelists. We all are quote unquote evangelical. They've just done a better job of marketing the term evan evangelicals. And so the you know, challenge with the evangelicals, when most of us know that 85% of them voted for Trump, uh, which I'm challenged by that. How can you vote for Trump? And then you've broken at least 60% of the Ten Commandments before you ever entered the White House office. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And so that means they were motivated not by the law of God, but they were motivated by the benefits of having a relationship with Donald Trump. And so the, 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 the problem with the so-called evangelicals are these men, primarily men, that lead this movement is that they have caused a chaos, confusion with our younger, uh, younger believers where we call them purple evangelicals where they say, well, I don't believe in the party, but I do believe in God. I am, I am, I am, I believe in, I'm sorry, I, I believe in God, but I don't believe in your religion. I, I am spiritual, but I am not necessarily religious. And so the challenge of that, of course, is that you don't have a chance to uh, sit down and talk with them because they would say that I am, I'm a nunner, or better yet, I am not one that wants to follow your doctrine or follow your religion. And so that has had an ill effect, uh, um, a horrible effect on the mainline movement. Why? Because we're all kind of lumped into this one party, uh, or lumped into this one group of people. The evangelicals not only have they lost members and caused other denominations to lose members, but we began to question Christianity. What is Christianity about? Is it, is it really about serving the least, the left out, and the left behind? Is it really about serving those uh, who are in need of support, uh, providing a witness for a way of life? Or is it really serving the rich? Is it really serving those who will benefit financially by uh, Pharaoh or by Constantine or by Trump? Um, and if we, I guess if we keep looking at the stock market, we may not even prosper with Trump, looking at what Greenspan said the other day. And so it, it is a problem. It is a challenge. It is a real problem for us. It's so much so that um, uh, we are meeting as a group of bishops. I'm not a bishop. Uh, we are meeting as a group, the bishops are meeting on January the 8th to talk about the evangelical movement and how it has been a destructive force within the Christian movement. I know that the AME Church, um, certainly First AME, and I'm sure your church as well, has taken on a number of initiatives in terms of housing, uh, in terms of family life, and, and I'm interested in, in how that gets explained in terms of its... In, in, as a faith gesture, 
What, what is the relationship between the faith gesture of accepting Christ and the notion of building housing for the poor or, or reaching out to, to, to drug addicts and that kind of social justice, social gospel? Maybe go back before I answer that question. Sure. Um, Interesting. Today, we had, I was before coming, I was at my church, and we had, uh, he just happened to be white, but he was also evangelical. He walked into our church today, and uh, uh, he, he didn't talk to me. I was upstairs. I didn't know. I, I found out as I was leaving that he said, your flag is not at half mask. And they said, why should it be? He, says, he said, the White House flag is at half mask because of the loss of George H. Bush. And he says, I understand why your, your flag is not at half mass, because you're a bunch of Democrats. And he walked out of the church. Now, in a regular world, maybe we think we just have a disgruntled Republican. Uh, but in, in our world today, that was a problem for us. So we had to get in contact with the Irvine Police Department we had to call our security. Why? Because there was a disgruntled person that walked into uh, Emmanuel AME Church uh, in the Carolinas, and he kills nine people. Uh, he was psychotic. And so we don't know the impact that uh, this administration is having on people who uh, are, are a little wacky in the first place or certainly may be caught up in their own politics. And so it has caused a, a real challenge for us. And so now, Tomorrow, we have to kind of beef up our security based on this one person who we did not know, who sat in the parking lot in his car for half an hour until, until he saw somebody going in the door because you can't look in our door without knowing somebody's there. And so when he gets, he gets out of his car, he walks inside, and he starts berating the fact that a flag is not at half mass. We don't know who he is. We don't know his name. But I, I just want to make sure that we see that that, these are, that there's a financial cost to all of this. Uh, not only does the Irvine Police Department have to put on more patrols, but now we have to pay for a little bit more security and we have to find ourselves in more protection. All right, let me go back to your question. Um, in the Christian tradition, the word, the word becomes flesh. The manifestation of God becomes a reality through Jesus Christ. Jesus says, don't serve me, let me serve you. Don't wash my feet, let me wash yours. Um, in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, our mission is to serve the social, spiritual, and uh, physical needs of our members. It's not the spiritual, it's not the physical, but it's the social first for us. And so, the scripture that supports that is if I'm hungry, did you feed me? When I was naked, did you clothe me? Uh, when I was homeless, did you house me? And so it's not about just having a great Sunday service because I don't believe there's a metric to measure how great Sunday service really is. You don't know if people had a great time. Unlike uh, Valley Beth Shalom, I wonder if most of my congregants are asleep when I'm preaching uh, I know you never go to sleep here when he's preaching. <laughs> I can tell by the reaction to that, they're all wide awake, Rabbi. <laughs> and in the black church, we tend to do things to try to keep you awake, but sometimes they fall asleep. So we can't, we can't put a value statement on that. It's wonderful to have a, a, a good worship service, but how do you put a quantitative, qualitative value? How do you measure the social impact of a worship service? I think it's very difficult. But we can measure uh, the social impact a church has based on how many housing projects we have and how many programs that we offer to youth who are dealing with their own sexual, sexuality and drugs and alcoholism and just bullying at school. How do we provide businesses small loans and how do we train people? Uh, for our church, I'm, I'm excited because we have 13 housing units that house, I think, close to 10,000 people a night. Um, and we have housing units up and down the state of California, and we're getting ready to open up two new housing units in Chicago, multifamily units. Um, and we also provide counseling for our youth 
and, and those counseling sessions uh, are important because last two years uh, we had, unfortunately, uh, three kids to commit suicide. I don't know if the same is true here at Valley Beth Shalom, but suicide seems to be the new movement for us uh, in the African-American community. But the one thing that I'm really excited about is a few years ago, we used to have rock houses in South LA. A group of men got together and we decided that the police certainly must do their job, but we must do our job. And so about 50 of us got together and we started marching the streets and we marched the streets for about two or three years and we were able to close 13 rock houses and bring about 500 people to church who are now members of church and they've gone on to finish high school and some have even graduated from college. I'll give Mark a break a second. Imam, welcome. We're, we're delighted you came back, thank you. Um, tell me about the same question in, in, with reference to the Islamic faith. Um, in the Christian tradition, there's this notion of a social gospel. That is, the, the expression of faith has to be out in the world. So the Rev says, um, I don't know who's listening to the sermon, but I know that we house 10,000 people a night. Uh, in the Jewish tradition, there's this notion of tikkun olam, that, that faith has to be represented in material acts in the world. How does that get expressed in the language of Islam? Well, I was, I was underdressed because I was hoping to just fade into the audience and listen to some wisdom, so I apologize for my casual appearance. The, um, the, the Prophet Muhammad, his, first of all, his life was, was an example of religion as social justice. Because when he first started preaching, the earliest verses of the Quran talked equally about worshiping only one true God and not worshiping false idols, but also equal weight, if not more, to the notion of the, the freeing of slaves and, and the, the movement. There are verses repeated in the Quran that if ever, you know, you, that you should free slaves. And if you were to make it, you know, commit a transgression of some moral sort, as part of your expiation of that transgression, free a slave also. So the, the idea is, let's say you, you, know, you, you broke a promise, you did something, you should repent. But part of repentance is to make up for what you did. And if it's against a certain person, that's fine. But also just part of your overall striving to do the right thing is to, is to engage in social justice. And at that time, there were, there were uh, many slaves in, in that society. And so you should free a slave. And so that's one aspect. The second area of focus is on the uh, just treatment of women. At that time in society, women were, um, were considered uh, a burden, especially if you had a woman as a, a, girl, a daughter as a firstborn, they consider it shameful. They wanted to have their firstborn to be a male. To the extent that in pre-Islamic times, Islam came and changed this, and this was again the emphasis of his teachings, if, if a family had a daughter as a firstborn, they would raise her till she was an infant, I mean a, a toddler, take her out to the desert, bury, uh, dig a hole and bury her alive. It's called female infanticide, hoping that the soul then would return as a male for their next born. It's, this is just outrageous. And so the Quran is, is, uh, is raising this issue in a very pointed way, for what sin is she buried? And, and, and when he taught his companions, it's honorable to have a daughter as your firstborn, and in fact, if you have three daughters and raise them well, you're guaranteed paradise. Right, so paradise is kind of literally or figuratively the uh, attainment of, of God's pleasure, right? The expression of that. And so that's number two. The third one is um, this kind of economic or social welfare focused on orphans and the disenfranchised and the marginalized. And this was so much the focus of his message, equal to belief in one God, that when he two small speeches that he gave in his life. When he first established the community and made the migration from being a persecuted minority in his hometown of Mecca to establishing uh, the community in Medina or Yathrib, about 300 miles north of Mecca, he was welcomed there by two warring tribes to bring peace to that society, and he did. But his first speech, he said three things, or four things. He said, when you, he said, 
this was his platform for his leader because he was being brought in as the leader to bring peace and harmony to that society. He said, feed the, those who need food. That was the first thing he said, feed those who are hungry. He said, number two, make peace. Make peace is not just like to say greetings of peace, but it's an actual activity, it's an action, it's proactive. And then he said, maintain family connections. Because here he was coming with a religion that some people were embracing, some people weren't. He said, family connections are important. And lastly, he said, pray at night when other people are sleeping. So out of the four things he said, one is theological and connected to God, and maybe that connection to God, which is sincere, and you engage in that when no one else is, is looking at you, gives you the deep enough reserve of love in your heart that you can then part with your money and your financial connection so that you can share it with those who are in need, food and, and other things, that you can forgive your, your, the person with whom you have enmity, and that you can put up with family even though they can be really annoying. So, uh, you know, so the, the social harmony comes from that. And lastly, his final farewell pilgrimage. This is now, he's achieved success. Arabia has now embraced Islam. He's, a, you know, in the last uh, few uh, months of his life, he makes a pilgrimage to Mecca in celebration of the, you know, or, or visit, in celebration of the deep faith of Abraham, which, you know, the, the pilgrimage is really a celebration of Abraham, our forefather, and his deep faith. It's a commemoration of that, uh, some events in his life. He's now speaking to 10,000 followers, and he says, in essence, three things. Number one, don't be racist. Number two, your, your, your property and your lives are sacred. Do not violate each other's property and lives. So don't engage in corruption or violence against one another, or injustice economically against one another. And lastly, he said, have fear of God and how you treat women, especially those over whom you have power. Each one of those three things is right out of the headlines today. Whether it's racism or corruption, either in political violence or the Me Too movement, right? I mean, these are all very relevant things. So yeah, his message, the language of his, someone asked, and I'll conclude with this, someone asked, you know, what is faith? And he responded, el iman, faith, not imam, but iman, with an N at the end. He said, Al-Imanu awlun wa amal. Faith is both word and deed. So let me extend that. The challenge I think we face with social justice in the 21st century context is not the what or even the why, but the how. Um, and this is where I believe my, our Jewish brothers and sisters come in. The AME Church establishes Payne Theological Seminary in 1869. Not too long before that, we establish uh, our Wilberforce University, which is the oldest black university in the United States. Um, in that case, it is like, what is it, almost 120 years at least? Maybe, maybe 110. Uh, before Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954 uh, dismantles segregated schools, where they desegregate, they never integrated, but they at least tried to desegregate schools in 1954. Before then, I believe many of my Jewish teachers could not teach in white public schools, or certainly have the opportunity to teach in some of the larger colleges where we would find our Jewish professors would come and teach in African-American schools. Certainly you taught at Wilberforce. You taught at Payne Theological Seminary. We have records to show it. You taught at many of the African-American schools like Howard, Morehouse. What needs to take place today in this wonderful room of educators and business people and professionals is this new partnership where we begin to teach business. We teach, I was talking to a couple, I don't see them, that understand real estate, teach the uh, principles of home ownership. How do we buy a home? How do you establish good credit? Those things are missing in the church. They have the desire, but in many cases they don't have the resources. My background, I'm a, I was a banker before I became a pastor. And when I told my wife I wanted to become a pastor, she says, that's good, but how are you going to pay the bills? 
And she said, I said, I will find the money. She says, that's good, I'll stay. But if you don't find the money, you may need to find a new wife. So, but my point is, is that, is that I don't believe that the partnership between the traditional, the historical partnership with the African American community and the, and the Jewish community, we must re-engage. We must re-engage to share our resources, to share our, our, our techniques, to share our, our learnings from historical, um, from, from relationships of the past, so that we can eradicate poverty, so that we can build models in these communities that are suffering from unemployment, poverty, homelessness, drug addiction. It's not that we don't have the desire. In many cases, we don't have the resources. So t tell me, if, if, if you can, with, in a few moments, does it give us a picture of where the African American church is today? You're in Irvine, which is a... Wonderful black community. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah. <laughs> well known for its long history of, of, black, of black activism. Um, yeah, I mean, so, so, so there's actually, you know, there is a, a large and growing black middle class in this country. And, and where is the church with regard to that community? And where is it regard to the more traditional black communities? Church is on the respirator. Um, young people are not coming to church. The millennials have no interest in church. Um, they, they don't have, they're, they're spiritual, but they're not religious. Uh, they don't claim any one of the denominations, certainly not the mainline or the Pentecostals, um, or the non-denominationals. They call themselves nunners. Um, and that has, hit the church. Uh, the major houses that we would say were at one time extremely successful uh, would be First AME Church in Los Angeles, uh, West Angeles Church of God in Christ in Los Angeles, City of Refuge in Los Angeles, Faithful Central, Crenshaw Christian Center. Either because of some moral uh, dilemma or just simply because people have gone on to heaven that you're finding that there's a 20 to as much as a 30% drop off in membership. Uh, it's, it's just not there. I think we're doing fine in, in Irvine simply because there's not a lot of options in, in Irvine. There's only about six African American churches uh, in Irvine that have their own building. The rest are in little hotel rooms or homes. And we have about 60,000 African Americans to include children in all of Orange County, out of three million uh, people that live in Orange County. So it's, we don't have the same challenges, although we do, uh, that they have in Los Angeles. Number two, people are not attending church physically, but the internet movement has just gone ablaze, uh, where people are literally attending church online, or they're watching it online. I have about 2,000 people a Sunday watching online. And so the same challenge is with the larger church. It, it, the, the, the Christian movement finds itself shrinking. Two reasons. One, uh, leadership has gotten older. Two, uh, the real challenge with young people. The Black Lives Matter movement was a great movement in my mind. It was a good movement because it challenged the status quo. It challenged paradigms that were antiquated that failed to meet the needs of our community. But the black church didn't get with Black Lives Matter. The, the black church did not sign into black, maybe because of its own homophobic beliefs, uh, maybe because the average member was much, it was three decades younger or four decades younger than the pastor. Uh, but whatever reason, Black Lives Matter and the church never met. I remember the first time I had a chance to meet Melina Abdullah, who's at Cal State LA, who was one of the principals behind uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, and I told her that I don't know why I haven't gone to one of the one of the rallies. Maybe I just didn't like their method. It wasn't from a, a Martin Luther King or Joshua Heschel. Uh, it, it did not it did not match what I'm used to at the age of 64. But I decided one day to go, and uh, it was an interesting journey for me because uh, I came from Irvine. And it was in downtown Los Angeles, so I was looking for a place to park. And every place, it, you know, it was the civil rights movement I'm used to is like parking a church, but they were in downtown Los Angeles, so you would have had to pay $50 to park 
I said, no, I don't want to pay $50 to be out here for 10 minutes. I don't hate me, just understand I don't like to spend a lot of money. So <laughs> I found a parking space and I walked like uh, at least a half a mile to where the rally was, got out there. And when I walked up in my clergy collar, literally these young people came up and they embraced me. It was like dad coming home. They were saying, thank God you're here. I wasn't judged. They immediately take the microphone out of one person's hand and give, me, give them the microphone, give me the microphone, and they asked me to pray for those men who have been killed by the LAPD. Uh, and I prayed for them. I know Jackie Lacey personally, and they said, we have to do something with Jackie Lacey. And Jackie Lacey saw me on the news that night and said, why are you out there with him? I said, why not? Wouldn't Martin Luther King do the same thing? And, and so at least she could see there was a bridge between the church and Black Lives Matter. And so, and I wrote an article, made national news. I don't understand why I made national news. I was just simply saying I should have been there all along, right? But the church, the black church has suffered because we have failed to connect. So I, I think it's not so much our belief, it is what we do with our belief. It's how we, it's how we operationalize our belief. Because I can believe on the internet, I can believe in podcasts. But if I'm not meeting the needs of the community, if, if I'm not meeting the social needs of the community, if I'm not serving the homeless and finding a way to take care of women who have been sexually abused and ostracized and victims of Me Too, then again, I must end with what good is the church? Other than a social club for most of the times, people who are, who are, who are privileged, uh, be it black, white, uh, Asian, or, or Muslim, are we are insulated in this place. We feel comfortable in this place. It's a beautiful place. It's a place of privilege. But if I'm outside and I don't feel that, I've, that I will fit in inside, then I'm not gonna go in because I don't feel like being ostracized by the grandmothers that told me I needed to go to church and I'm treated the same way in church that I'm treated outside of the church. Imam, the, the, uh, let's take the same question. Um, where is the, as it were, the mosque, the, the, the Muslim community with regard to young folks, the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, those who check, you know, what is your current religion, they check none, millennials. Is the mosque attracting them or are they departing as well? So I would, uh, I, I think I referenced last night a Pew study. I just was reading one yesterday. Uh, most, the only growing, um, demographic in the United States are the nuns, right? People who are non-affiliated or non-religious or atheist even. Um, in Islam, the American Muslim context, it's a wash, meaning we have a growing number of people embracing Islam, converts, and equal number of people leaving the faith uh, and, and not identifying as Muslim. So it actually it, it ends up evening, evening out. And I would say that there's not an evenness in our communities. We have communities that get it. One third of our community African American. Two thirds are immigrants or the children thereof for the most part. And those communities that came in the 60s and 70s and 80s after the opening up of the, of the immigration policies as I referenced last night as a result of the civil rights movement, they came as educated elites from their respective uh, home countries and ended up settling here. And we have a large number of Muslim doctors and engineers accordingly, those two professions in particular. Number one, doctors, number two, engineers. We, there was a survey done when this whole you know, uh, Muslim ban happened about the number of office hours um, that Muslim immigrants who came over as immigrants, as doctors, and are working in, in impoverished rural communities around the country had been offering, and it was something like 386,000 hours a month or some ridiculous number of, the, of, uh, of, of those who are Muslim doctors. That being said, they establish communities, and as the critical mass of, let's say, Indo-Pakistanis or Arabs gathered together, they would establish a mosque that reminded them of home. And they would create this cultural oasis that very much resembled the spirituality that they remembered as children, those who would even attend mosques. So let's say, you know, 70% faded into the, works, into the woodworks are not even affiliated, either because they're not religious, they're spiritual, not religious, or they completely left their identity as Muslims. The 30% that did 
come and form a mosque. They formed a mosque on the image of back home, which is fine for them because they're comfortable and they feel it's reminiscing, it's, you know, they're homesick, etc. All, all is well and good until their children are born and raised and their, ident their identity is American, not Pakistani, not Arab, and so they don't find relevance at the mosque. And it's only when there's a critical mass of young people losing the faith or leaving the faith or running away from the mosque that the, the organizers, the leaders, the founders of the mosque, they have a wake-up call and they say, okay, we need to reorient, we need to rethink, reimagine what is the role of, of the mosque in the community and the identity formation, let's focus on the youth. And those handful of communities around the country, and there are about 2,500 mosques now across the United States, there are about 3.3 million Muslims in the U.S. Um, those mosques are succeeding. You have someone who's a dynamic leader in, let's say, the south side of Chicago in the person of, let's say, Rami Nashashibi, who created a community that's not really focused on the mosque per se, but instead created something called Inner City Muslim Action Network, Iman, also meaning faith. It's an acronym. But what, what does he do? He creates an opportunity to, to make religion transformative. He will bring together the various communities, African American, immigrant, children thereof, et cetera, and society at large, and teach community organizing as his spiritual practice. And they will work with local government and state government and federal government to, to take over drug houses and then work with those who are, who are formerly incarcerated, who had embraced Islam in prison, who are getting back out after 10, 20, 30 years, giving them, a, apprenticing them as carpenters and with, to be contractors. And they would gut and renovate the house and they would pay those individuals so, enough so that when the house is renovated, one of them could begin to purchase those houses. Um, and transforming the neighborhood because when you have someone who had done t 20 or 30 years in prison, probably for you know, some major crime and survived and is on the straight and narrow now and is living in a neighborhood, people you know, who are involved in criminal activity are gonna give some deference and respect to that OG, right? To that individual who has uh, a, a sense of self and respect uh, in the community and it transforms neighborhoods. So young people then see faith as an opportunity to contribute to something that's meaningful and fulfilling. And, and it's when you're out in the world and you see that you can move the needle and make a difference, those communities are succeeding, most are not. And that's what we're trying to do at the graduate school is to bridge that gap from the theory to the practice and it's the operate, operate, uh, operate, operate what's the word? Operational, operationalizing the faith that we're, that we're trying to focus on. Uh, because that's really the, 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 the way to a successful future. Wow. Wow. Rev, you, you and I are the same age. So I remember, you remember Martin Luther King, at least watching him on TV, listening on the radio. Uh, but you're dealing with a generation of young folks who, who know him only from history books. So I'm interested in what you say about who is King to you and who is King to them, and, and how do you present an image of, of, this, this, of this personality? So, so my doctoral thesis was on creating the beloved community. And for me, Dr. King, I remember in the fifth grade, and he's on this 10-inch television. I don't know if they made TVs any bigger in the black community than 10-inch screens. <laughs> uh, and the teacher brought it in, and we watched the I Have a Dream speech. And I remember in our, in our community, we only saw black people in the community, never on TV, even though Nat King Cole had a show at that time. But, but you never really saw black people on TV. And so you see this guy who was a giant, and he's speaking. And for me, it was like, I want to grow up to be like him. Um, and so I model my, my life, my speech, my projects, my deeds after a Martin Luther King Jr. Because this five foot six son of a of a of a pastor of a grandfather who's a pastor who who goes on to uh, attend Morehouse and Crozier and Brown, um, and then gives up everything his career to help other people, and then 
is assassinated by some white racist. Um, for me, it is, he is the model. He is the model for social justice, for civil rights. In the 21st century paradigm, I think you're right. I think multimedia has uh, given us so many other models. Um, and so much so the African-American community, as I understand it, um, Professor, I'm at USC, you're at Claremont, but I see the shrinking African-American pool of students. I don't know why, maybe it's affordability, it could be because there may be an alternative, but there was always, some people say it was rap, no, I don't think so. We used to do wop on the corner singing, you know, to the Temptations or the Five Heartbeats or the Ink Spots, I mean, we used to sing. So singing is no different than rapping was in my day but they're not going and we don't see ourselves as the, our education is the way out of the inner city. I don't even see it in sports. Um, I just don't see it and, and I'm, I, I think we are dealing in a generation that I don't understand. That's when I, I'm starting to say, maybe I'm just completely out of touch. And I do have sons uh, who are, are in their 30s and for some reason, they still are in touch with my wallet and my bank account. <laughs> you all have sons like that too. Yeah. Yeah. Ain't much different than us, amen. Uh, so I, I'm a little lost because I asked my son, he took forever to get out of college. I said, why did it take you so long? He said, because you kept paying for it. I said, oh, okay, I got it. Um, there, <laughs> right? <laughs> it, it, and and I'm, I, I don't know, I, we are, I, I'm a, I went to business school also at, at, um, at USC and you fail and you fail fast and you fail forward. And so at our church, we're constantly trying new things with the youth and we fail at it and we fail forward and we fail fast and we get back up and we try something else. But the attention span of, of, of this generation or the millennials it just seems like it's short as a net. It, it just doesn't, and you gotta constantly do things to keep their attention, which says that there's a bigger mousetrap. It's not that we don't get their attention, there's a better mousetrap outside of the church. And so, and so for me, they don't know King, but they know King, because they had to study King in high school. They had to study King from their parents but King doesn't impress them. Um, so I don't know any longer, I, I, and I must confess it, I don't know. I wish I did know, because if I did know, then my church would be flooded with young people. My church is not flooded with young people. Um, I, I, I have some people, but it, it's, it's a lot of gray-haired adults. And so I, I, I keep asking myself the question, let me just keep trying, and maybe it's not King anymore. It's somebody else. I need to find out who it is. Imam, is, is there a character in the American Muslim community or in the world Muslim community that is something like Martin Luther King is to the African, a, a moral example, a, a, a bridge to a, a better a vision of what could be? Is there a moral kind of prophet example like that in the, in the Muslim community? No. no I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, that is the answer. I mean, there are individuals, there are individuals who model some aspect of moral clarity or of spirituality that people are drawn to in the millions. So you'll have someone like a Habib Jifri, someone you've never heard of before, who um, you know, is a spiritual leader and a Sufi. And people, you know, he's 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 a moderate. You know, you would be described as a moderate Muslim in terms of he's not fanatical or violent extremist or et cetera. He's about love, he's about working together for humanity, et cetera. Um, and he has a certain degree of traction and credibility and millions and millions of followers and he's beloved. Another example of that is someone like Ben Beya, someone who President Obama gave a shout out to in his last prayer breakfast. Um, uh, remember we used to have President Obama, remember that? So, uh, so, so yeah, he, you know, he's, he's a figure, again, he's in the Arab world, doesn't speak English, but he has millions and millions of followers. 
Um, there are people like that in different parts of the Muslim world. Those are two Arab uh, individuals, men. There are um, also example, I mean, they're the largest Muslim organization on the planet. Anyone know where it is? Indonesia, and do you know what, the, you know what it's called? There are two actually, two of the largest in the, in the world. One is called NU, or Nahdatul Ulama, and we'll stick with NU. And the other one is called Al Muhammadiyah. So NU has over 50 million followers, all right? Uh, it's an organization, 50 million uh, members adhere to that. They have elementary schools, uh, high schools, colleges, orphanages, hospital. I mean, they're like a, this huge infrastructure for Indonesia, which is a develop, still a developing country. And, you know, they are an organization, they have a leader, an elected leader, but the leader changes, but they are, you know, uh, uh, a very positive force in that society. Both of those two groups are, quite frankly. Um, so in the U.S. context, uh, the problem with, with those two Sufi leaders that I mentioned earlier, the problem is you have bad actors in the region, people, you know, uh, governments, who then say, okay, let's try and co-opt that message to counter those who want to criticize our regime that is dictatorial and suggest that, well, you shouldn't be involved in politics, you should just focus on the spirituality. And then those people who want to stand for social justice and criticize a, an oppressive regime that's squashing people's right to free speech or you know, who, are, who want to emphasize uh, peacemaking in the region when they see a government is engaging in war, let's say in Yemen or in Libya or in other parts of the world in an unhelpful way or supporting a group like ISIS in Iraq, et cetera, um, and Afghanistan, you know, all kinds of, of, of challenges, right, where the government is, is a bad actor. The government doesn't want to hear that criticism, so they support a leader like one of these people who then gets co-opted and then people are disillusioned. They say, well, you're just now a puppet for that regime because you're given funding by that person, you're, giving, uh, you're given safe, uh, you know, um, a safe haven there and a home base. And so this is actually happening. So it's really, dis and I'm, I'm part of these WhatsApp groups with Muslim leaders, prominent Muslim leaders from around the country, and these, are, these conversations are, are intense they're, they're, they're happening, I'm, you know, I've been reading just the last two days, probably, you know, 500 messages back and forth regarding Erdogan in Turkey, who's now turning, you know, made this right turn and is closing down all of these, uh, you know, um, uh, his opponents, but also free speech and is really becoming a despot. So, you know, how do, where, where are these, these individuals, these figures? We, we don't have, there, there is no one individual, but what we are seeing are a number of social justice activists. And some of them might not be popular in this room, like Elinda Sarsour, who is an, who's, who's you know, one of the founders of the Women's March, and who's you know, a very left-leaning person in, in terms of her politics, and is a, a, an, a, a, um, an ally to the Black Lives Matter movement, and is really, she's not a scholar, she's not a religious leader, but she wears her Islam on her head and on her sleeve, and it, you know, is very outspoken on certain issues, probably also unpopular because she's very critical of Israel, et cetera. So I'm not suggesting and holding her up as the leader for the community, but she has a lot of young people who follow her in the American Muslim community. Um, so what we're trying, to, what we're trying to, uh, to do at the graduate school is not necessarily have, because we, we're so disorganized, we don't have a hierarchy, there's not really a chance for someone to really rise up, up in, a, in a formal way. It, what we're trying to do is empower local leaders to really be change agents in their local communities. And so one of our graduates, who's an African-American imam, whose father came through the Nation of Islam and converted to mainstream Islam when the founder, Elijah Muhammad, uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, passed away in 1975, he started a little storefront mosque in the south side of the south central Los Angeles, and it had been, you know, it had been going along slowly since then until about five years ago when he graduated our program. He transformed that mo that that little storefront mosque into a thrift shop, thrift shop. Bought the old Marcus Garvey Elementary School and a half block around it. Raised almost two million dollars from primarily from the immigrant Muslim communities that he had developed a network with, 
uh, is building a proper mosque there, started an elementary school or transformed that elementary school into something called Reform Los Angeles or in Arabic, Islah LA, and uh, started a food pantry there that feeds over 500 local non-Muslim families in the neighborhood every Saturday and started a nonprofit that helps people who've embraced Islam in prison to reintegrate back into society through job skills and other things, and is finishing up his PhD at UCLA, I mean at uh, UC, uh, I'm sorry, Claremont School of Theology in religious education, comparative theology and philosophy, so that he can better serve his communities and have the right credentials to be able to take his community to the next position. He's one of of 20, well, 19 recipients of the Muhammad Ali Scholarship that is uh, investing in local leaderships who have already demonstrated commitment to help them with the skill set to transform their community. So he's not a, a national figure of great repute who has a, but he is a hero in his local community. Do you remember his name? Jihad Safir. Yeah, I know Safir. You probably know his father too. Went, his father has been around for quite a Safir while. Safir went to our program called uh, Amclay. Yeah, Amicly. Yeah, he went to Amicly. I, I, I do think that, in, in, and there's nothing against King, I, I think men have had their turn and there's now women who are stepping up. Uh, we, we've done as much as bad as we probably could have done. And I, I, I think what we're seeing now in the Christian church, it, women are stepping up. Women are stepping up in the position. And so this decentralization of leadership, male leadership, I think has to take place, and the Me Too movement is good, but these 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 silos that are controlled by men, I think has to be dis have to be dismantled, because in my home, my wife is the smartest thing that I have, and I have the benefit of having my mother there too, so I go to church just to feel some sense of power. <laughs> <laughs> But I go home and get the answers. So, uh, uh, so, so I, I, I think that's what we're seeing. I, 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 when I, I knew John Connors, uh, and, I, and I thought he was a hero. And, and I'm looking at this woman who was sexually um, harassed by this legendary not, uh, civil rights leader. And I'm looking at her on television, and she's giving her story. At first, I felt a little offended. And then I started listening to her about the fact that she had four kids to raise. And when, when this legendary civil rights man comes out in his underwear and, and asks her to bed her, and he, she says no, but she didn't report it because she knew that retaliation may follow and she could lose her job and not take care of her kids. In the African American community, 70% of mothers raise the children without any male support. Most of the times they're working two jobs, uh, working from can't see to can't see just to take care of their family, yet their voices are muted, their respect is little, and often they're not invited to the table unless they have to give some type of favor. I think that has to come to an end. And so we may not see a Dr. Martin Luther King, we may not see a Malcolm X, we may not see a Stokely Carmichael, and rightfully so because women need, and I believe, or this intersectionality that we deal with, women don't have the same challenges men have. We dealt with racism, but we didn't deal with racism and sexism, right? And so I think it's time for women to take their place, not only take their place, but lead us to a better place. Mm. I, I want to finish with a, I you want to clap for that one? That's good. I think they say amen in that church, so we, we can learn how to do that. I, I want to end with a really simple, very quick question. Um, uh, it's 2019 in about a week. It's kind of an odd number, so I think we're all thinking 2020 and then 2030. You look forward 10 years. What do you hope for? When you open the paper in the morning, what are you praying to read as a headline? Thank you. <laughs> what do you hope that we have a new president. All right. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I think at the, I think at the, you know, at the, at the, the, we're in the middle of it right now, and it's kind of murky. But I'm, I'm really the way I see it is we're there's a struggle for the soul of America taking place, and that struggle is about understanding who we are as a people. It's an attitude. It's a posture. 
It's a, w a way that we can come together or not. And my hope is that in 2020, 2030, the, the headline will be mundane and it'll be talking about a particular project dealing with the environment that we've come to rally around and whether it's better to, uh, as, a, as a strategy, undertake a major project uh, X to help the environment or Y to help the environment. I hope that we're not talking about fighting and conflict and warfare domestically or internationally, but we're talking about coming together to tackle a collective issue of, uh, of this planet in which we live on because we've already taken care of one another uh, and uh, uh, recovered from this major disparity of income, the wealth gap, and that we've uh, you know, moved away from, from the kind of uh, conflict, again, domestically and internationally, that we see dominating our headlines today. That's my hope. For me, it's, it's moving from the selfish um, quest to draw closer to God to becoming selfless, to come out of self into the greater self of God, coming out of self into the greater self of God. Because God gives a self-love to bring people together for the purposes of what we see here on the stage. If, if, if anyone can take a picture, you have Islam, you have Judaism, Christianity, all born from the father Abraham. Oh man, that's just wonderful. So I carry this canister around because um, I'm on a fast. I, I eat a salad once a day. Um, but I, I have fruits and some stuff in there that keep me uh, kind of proteined up. On November the 8th or so, you met with Reverend Dr. Najuma Smith Pollard. Uh, not on November 8th, but you, read with Reverend, you met with Dr. Najuma Smith Pollard, I think, two weeks ago and she spoke about the loss of her son. I've known Reverend Juju, uh, and that's her nickname, since she was 17. Um, and when she walked into First Day of Me Church. She leaves First Day of Me Church and she comes and she um, works at my church as the youth pastor. She has her son with her and her son looks at me and he says, I heard about this, and he's now like nine years old. He says, I heard about this baptism thing. I want to get baptized today. And I said, no, we don't do baptisms except on the fourth Sunday. He says, you don't get it. I want to get baptized today. And so he's nine years old, and I said, okay, we're going to do it today. And so I baptized him. And he grows, and he, he's a wonderful kid. I've, I've known him all of his life. And um, he gets shot in the brains. And when Reverend Jum says, Mark, his brain is coming out of his mouth. And I'm talking to her every day. Every day, five times a day. I'm in LA, she's in Vegas where he got murdered. And I remember God saying to me, he says, you can pray, and that's good. He says, but why don't you take it up a notch? Why don't, why don't you fast? And so I'm fasting for the end of gang, gun violence, and I'm fasting for peace. And, and I started fasting, and then a couple of my Jewish friends in Orange County found out, now I've got 150 Jews fasting with me in Orange County. It's crazy. The point is, is that while we have this belief in God, and some people don't believe in God, but those who do believe in God, do we operationalize that faith? Or do we just kind of go through our prayers, our litanies, and our, our ceremonies, and then we go home, and we go back to what we're doing? For me, I think we must do more than just go through the ceremony. Maybe this seems crazy because we've had more deaths. But on that weekend that Reverend Ajuma Smith Pollard's son was murdered, I believe right down the street was the borderline killings here 
right down the street? Thousand Oaks. Yeah. Thousand Oaks. Yeah. How many students lost their lives that day? Yeah. Yeah. Thirteen. Thirteen. The same day he was murdered is the same day that took place. So I put it out. I put a press release out, what we're doing, made a bunch of news. But if we're silent, then what difference are we, what is, what is the difference between us and the guy that pulled the trigger? I don't want to be known by the number of friends I have. I don't. I want to be known by the number of people I've helped and the impact that we've had on their lives. In 2019, I like to look for measurable results. Yeah, I'd like to get the guy out of the White House, but whether he's in the White House or not, we have a bigger responsibility than to just focus on what takes place in that funny little house built by black people. We have a larger community to take place. Let's bring about some social change in 2019. I think Rabbi Showice would have enjoyed this conversation an awful lot. I want to thank our, sorry? I think so. I want to thank our dear friends, Reverend Mark Whitlock, Imam Jihad Turk. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, everyone. Shabbat Shalom.